So, the Rugby World Cup has arrived and we've already had our share of incredible moments, upsets and controversy, which has had most of Rugby Twitter and Reddit up in arms. But, that's what the Rugby World Cup is all about, people. Moments, good, bad, funny, sad, all have a place in the rugby world. Which is why I must come up with the definitive list of the top 10 best Rugby World Cup moments. Now, to set the tone for this video, let's talk about the 10th best moment in Rugby World Cup history, Number 10, Pocock sends Shane Williams to the moon. Now, we've all bared witness to this man mountain, that jackal machine, the big carved, big armed, big shouldered, big game playing man myth and handsome legend David Pocock skills around the rugby field. He is, to put it simply, decent at rugby. But no big turnover, no big tackle, no man of the match performance is more of an embodiment of this man's manly manliness than this moment, where Shane Williams attempts to clear his lines and my hero and yours, David, or as I call him, Big D, murders Shane Williams in a way that only cars and other massive machines can. Look at it. <laughs> Hilarious. Also, Tofu Pilotta helped. I guess. Moving on from those cold, hard facts. Let's talk about another mysterious beast, and where we will find him is at number 9. It's Brian Lima, smashing everything. Because the Samoan chiropractor doesn't play by your rules or mine, or sometimes even rugby's rules. To even say Brian Lima is a man is insulting, as he's more of a creature of cosmic destruction, and no moment in rugby history is more of an example of his violent, unfiltered, raw, uncompromising power than when he smashed Eric Hohard. As a child, I was blessed not to have seen a man murdered at the hands of another, until my eight-year-old eyes saw this brutal, vicious, daylight assault. Men shouldn't be this strong. The people who watched this were witnesses to murder, and the players had to go into deep prayer straight after to cleanse themselves. On a serious note, I cannot imagine being hit this hard and not being able to see him coming and brace myself. That is horrendous and awesome. Throw anything else Brian Lima did into this entry as well, because he is a rebel who does not play by society's rules. Now on to number eight, Habana gets burnt. Now, picture the scene. It's 2007. South Africa are tearing stuff up. And Habana, so far in the tournament, has been ripping out even more than he usually does, announcing himself on the world stage as basically the fastest thing a rugby field has ever seen. Then steps up America's speed machine, Nguenya, and he says, Oh! So you think you have speed, hmm. Let me just whip out my speed and we'll see who's the big boy on campus. And he roasts him on toast and is rewarded with a career in Biarritz after the World Cup is over. And it doesn't matter USA got humped in this game because no one cares because Habana got roasted. America? Frickin' yes. Next up, number seven, Johnny Wilkinson's drop goal against Australia to win the World Cup, and all crucial World Cup drop goals in general. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, but NGJ, why is this era and childhood defining moment for you ranked down so low? Well, returning whining child, I am again extremely glad you asked. Well, first up, here at NGJ Rugby, we value all drop goals in clutch situations as it's an extremely hard skill to do, especially in high pressure. So, the likes of Josh Stransky and Stephen Larkham all deserve a mention, and it would be unfair to rank any one of them above the other. But also, drop goals are the most unsatisfactory way to win or lose a rugby game. Win it with a try, you cowards! Or at least a penalty where the pressure can build for the kicker. And on the other side of the ball, you have a scapegoat who you can blame all your childhood, health, and substance abuse problems on. I see you, Martin Johnson, in the final against Australia in 2003. You almost lost us the game, you coward! I'm only joking, please. I have pillows at home who love me. Speaking of things I love, it's now time to talk about number six. The French at World Cups. Now, despite the fact I'm English and most of the world already hates me because I know how to pronounce Bath properly, I love the French. I love their jazz. I love their rap. I love the idea of being blasé about most things. I've loved their football players. I love their football team. I love the fact that berets exist. And most of all, I love their rugby team. I've already done a video on how the French culture, traditions, and altogether lack of cohesion is crippling the national team. But this just adds to my love of the team, as no matter what goes on behind the scenes, the French will always be fascinating to watch at World Cups. Good or bad, mediocre or sublime, a piece of divine art that is both reserved and strikingly flamboyant, or just there, they are always breathtaking to watch, for whatever reason they feel like on that particular day. And no moment is more cliche French than their victory over the All Blacks in 1999. It was just the best. 
So, the story. In the build-up to the match, the French weren't really given a chance, as the All Blacks had just looked so dominant in this tournament up to this point. But the French scored the first try and were looking decent in the early exchanges. Of course the All Blacks had Jonah Lomo in their team, and a Jonah's gonna Jonah. So he scored after like five guys tried to tackle him, and the All Blacks used this momentum and managed to take the lead before half time. And then Jonah Lomu Lomu'd all over the French again, in his signature style. And most people thought, okay, now it's over. Well done, France. Good try. But the French, despite losing by 14 points at this point, decided, we aren't going to play for a low scoring loss. We're going to win. Fuck Lomu, we have a fullback with blue hair. That's what I call menacing. And they threw caution to the wind and played in a way only they can when they have some momentum going and won the semi final, knocking the All Blacks out. And of course, after that game, they went on to lose to the Wallabies. Ah. Magnifique. Speaking of magnific, and also because I've already mentioned him, it's time to talk about number five, Jonah Bloody Lomu, and his performance against England in 1995. Now, Jonah Lomu was the first and only real superstar in rugby who single handedly forced the sport into the professional era. He was usually the biggest, strongest, fastest bloke on the pitch, which meant that his highlight reel up to this point had been pretty outstanding. But this game took him to a whole new level. New Zealand were obviously dominant in this game, with the forwards doing drop kicks and having a general higher level of skill than any other team in this competition. But the icing on this all black cake was how Jonah Lomu was just da man. Running over Mike Cat being one of the most iconic moments in Rugby World Cup history. And actually, we can just add everything else cool that Jonah Lomu did this World Cup into the spot as well, especially against England. What a man. Now time for number four, Gregan's antics in 2003. Now, George Gregan is one of my favourite scrum halves ever, a skillful leader of men who just happened to be one of the biggest gobby bastards in the world when he wanted to be. Now that's talent, and I respect it. Only Austin Healy rivals him in terms of rugby gobby antics, and that is saying something. And although George has mellowed after retiring, let me take you back to a time where Gregan was what Australian rugby was supposed to be, the embodiment, cocky, uncompromising, and most importantly, slightly smug. In 2003, Australia were hosts of their own World Cup and had managed to get to the semi-finals where they were facing their mortal enemy and opposites, the All Blacks. And the game had gone pretty well. They've somehow managed to contain Carlos Spencer, who was on fire before this game. And you've got the game basically won at this point. But the All Blacks are still playing and giving it their best. And in the last minute, a penalty is given to the Wallabies, basically killing the game. And Gregan takes this opportunity to stare down his opposite number, repeating the years, four more years, boys four more years, right in his mush. No sportsmanship, savagery only. And interestingly, it was actually eight more years till the All Blacks would get their hands on the Webb Ellis Trophy. But Karma has sort of over course corrected because now they might win their third in a row. So yeah. Anyway, Gregan, you're the best. Now onto the coveted bronze medal. Number three, England being knocked out of their own World Cup. Now, even I can admit, a host nation going out in the group stage is, is a shocking and compelling moment. Then you add on to the fact that it is England who are getting knocked out, the country that invented the sport. It was just mental, and that's my objective opinion on this. On the other hand, why? Why? This was the most depressing thing I've ever watched. We were comfortably winning against Wales, and then we just crapped all over the bed. Then don't even get me started on the game against Australia, where we were so outplayed and outmoved it was ridiculous. In our own home World Cup, which by the way, if you weren't a rugby fan before the tournament, you wouldn't have even known it was happening here. It was just the biggest waste of time, money and emotional effort I have ever experienced in my life. Altogether a crapshoot, and I wished everyone would stop talking about it. Anyway, number two, all of the Japan. Now, Japan have settled into the role of being everyone's second favourite international rugby team quite nicely, and there are a few reasons for this. First, they have always and probably will always play energetic, fast-paced rugby. This is due to the fact that the populace as a whole in Japan has never been the biggest, but what they have been is quick and smart with how they played. This has meant that at every World Cup they've been to, they have had exceptionally fun games to watch with exceptionally creative and fast-paced tries. Not just recently, the games between Japan and countries like Fiji and the US were my favourites in the 2003 World Cup, as well as their performance against Wales in 2007, scoring one of the best rugby World Cup tries ever. And now, recently, they have taken their play and output to new, unprecedented heights. First, there was the Brighton Miracle, the actual best game of rugby I have ever watched, where the Japanese somehow defeated the Springboks in 2015, in the last seconds of the game in one of the most hard-fought and hearty performances I have ever seen in my life, and were the first team unlucky enough to win three games in their group and still not make it to the quarterfinals. But they weren't done. 
Japanese rugby went from strength to strength this year as they won the Pacific Nations Cup remaining undefeated, beating the likes of Fiji, Tonga, Samoa and USA. And just recently they defeated the number one ranked team in the world at the time, Ireland, in the second game of their home World Cup. What a nation, what an achievement, what else can I say? Japan, you guys are the real MVP. Now before I announce the number one pick in my Rugby World Cup greatest moments, it's time for the honourable mentions. Carlos Spencer's masterclass in the 2003 World Cup, David Campisi's magical pass in 991, All Blacks winning back-to-back -back World Cups for the first time in history, the French doing all the amazing things like beating New Zealand in 2007 and their comeback versus the Wallabies in 1987, how they got to the 2011 final. Contrastingly, the French doing all the other things like losing to Tonga in the same year in the group stages and losing twice to Argentina in their own home World Cup, Fiji's magical 2007 World Cup performances against Wales and South Africa. The game where Wales gave the All Blacks a scare in 2003, Mark Quaito's try that didn't count, Samoa's win over Wales in 1991, Larkham's drop goal versus South Africa in 1999, and Jason Robinson doing all the Jason Robinson things in 2003. Tasty. Now, number one. Nelson Mandela hands the World Cup to South Africa. Yes, the best moment in World Cup history is the one where Nelson Mandela hands the World Cup to South African captain Francois Pina. In the moment that's steeped in emotional history as the Rainbow Nation wins its first World Cup. And if you disagree, agree with this being number one, I'm afraid you're a massive racist. I hope you guys have enjoyed, and if you like stuff like this, please let me know in the comments below. Take it easy guys, signed, N-G-J.